while the gods laugh. Quoting Mervyn Peake, Shapes and Sounds, 1941. I, while the gods laugh, the world's vortex am, the maelstrom of passions in that hidden sea, whose waves of all time lap the coasts of me, and in small compass the dark waters cram. One night, as Elric sat moodily drinking alone in a tavern, a wingless woman of Mirren came gliding out of the storm and rested her lithe body against him. Her face was thin and frail-boned, almost as white as Elric's own albino skin, and she wore flimsy, pale green robes which contrasted well with her dark red hair. The tavern was ablaze with candle flame and alive with droning argument and gusty laughter, but the words of the woman of Mirren came clear and liquid, carrying over the zesty din. I have sought you twenty days, she said to Elric, who regarded her insolently through hooded crimson eyes and lazed in a high-backed chair, a silver wine cup in a long-fingered right hand, and his left on the pommel of his sorceress runesword Stormbringer. Twenty days, murmured the Melnibonean softly, speaking as if to himself. Deliberately rude. A long time for a beautiful and lonely woman to be wandering the world. He opened his eyes a trifle wider and spoke to her directly. I am Elric of Melnibone, as you evidently know. I grant no favours and ask none. Bearing this in mind, tell me why you have sought me for twenty days. Equably, the woman replied, undaunted by the albino's supercilious tone. You are a bitter man, Elric. I know this also. And you are grief-haunted for reasons which are already legend. I ask you no favours, but bring you myself and a proposition. What do you desire most in the world? Peace, Elric told her simply. Then he smiled ironically and said, I am an evil man, lady, and my destiny is hell-doomed, but I am not unwise nor unfair. Let me, let me remind you a little of the truth. Call this legend if you prefer, I do not care. A woman died a year ago on the blade of my trusty sword. He patted the blade sharply, and his eyes were suddenly hard and self-mocking. Since then I have courted no woman and desired none. Why should I break such secure habits? If asked, I grant you that I could speak poetry to you, and that you have a grace and beauty which moves me to interesting speculation. But I would not load any part of my dark burden upon one as exquisite as you. Any relationship between us other than formal would necessitate my unwilling shifting of part of that burden. He paused for an instant and then said slowly, I should admit that I scream in my sleep sometimes and are often tortured by incommunicable self-loathing. Go while you can, lady, and forget Elric, for he can only bring grief to your soul. With a quick movement he turned his gaze from her and lifted the silver wine cup, draining it and replenishing it from a jug at his side. No, said the wingless woman of Mirren calmly, I will not. Come with me. She rose and gently took Elric's hand. Without knowing why, Elric allowed himself to be led from the tavern and out into the wild, rainless storm which howled around the Filcarian city of Rastil. A protective and cynical smile hovered about his mouth as she drew him towards the sea-lashed quayside, where she told him her name. Sharilla of the Dancing Mist wingless daughter of a dead necromancer, a cripple in her own strange land, and an outcast. Elric felt uncomfortably drawn to this calm-eyed woman who wasted few words. He felt a great surge of emotion well within him, emotion he had never thought to experience again, and he wanted to take her finely moulded shoulders and press her slim body to his. But he quelled the urge and studied her marble delicacy and her wild hair, which flowed in the wind about her head. 
Silence rested comfortably while between them, while the chaotic wind howled mournfully over the sea. Here Elric could ignore the warm stink of the city, and he felt almost relaxed. At last, looking away from him towards the swirling sea, her green robe curling in the wind, she said, You have heard, of course, of the dead god's book. Elric nodded. He was interested, despite the need he felt to dissociate himself as much as possible from his fellows. The mythical book was believed to contain knowledge, which could solve many problems that had plagued men for centuries. It held a holy and mighty wisdom which every sorcerer desired to sample, but it was belief destroyed, hurled into the sun when the old gods were dying in the cosmic wastes which lay beyond the outer reaches of the solar system. Another legend, apparently of late origin, spoke vaguely of the Dark Ones who had interrupted the book's sunward coursing and had stolen it before it could be destroyed. Most scholars discounted this legend, arguing that by this time the book would have come to light, if it did still exist. Elric made himself speak flatly, so that he appeared to be disinterested when he answered Shardilla. Uh, why do you mention this book? I know it exists, Shirilla replied intensely, and I know where it is. My father acquired the knowledge just before he died. Myself, and the book, you may have, if you will help me to get it. Could the secret of peace be contained in a book, Ulrich wondered? Would he, if he found it, be able to dispense with Stormbringer? If you want it so badly that you seek my help, he said eventually, why do you not wish to keep it? Well, because I would be afraid to have such a thing perpetually in my custody. It is not a book for a woman to own, but you are possibly the last mighty necromancer left in the world, and it is fitting that you should have it. Besides, you might kill me to obtain it. I would never be safe with such a small volume in my hands. I need only one small part of its wisdom. And what is that? Ulrich inquired, studying her patrician beauty with a new pulse stirring within him. Her mouth set and the lids fell over her eyes. When we have the book in our hands, then you will have your answer, not before. Well, that answer's good enough, Ulrich remarked quickly, seeing that he would gain no more information at that stage. And the answer appeals to me. And then half before he realised, he seized her shoulders in his slim, pale hands and pressed his colourless lips to her scarlet mouth. Elric and Sharila rode westwards towards the silent land, across the lush plains of Shazar where their ship had berthed two days earlier. The border country between Shazar and the silent land was a lonely stretch of territory, unoccupied even by peasant dwellings. A no man's land, though fertile and rich in natural wealth. The inhabitants of Shazar had deliberately refrained from extending their borders further, for though the dwellers in the silent land really ventured beyond the marshes of the mist, the natural borderline between the two lands, the inhabitants of Shazar held their unknown neighbours in almost superstitious fear. The journey had been clean and swift. Though ominous, with several persons who should have known nothing of their purpose warning the travellers of nearing danger, Elric brooded, recognising the signs of doom but choosing to ignore them and communicate nothing to Sharilla, who, for her part, seemed content with Elric's silence. They spoke little in the day and so saved their breath for the wild love play of the night. The thud of the two horses' hooves on the soft turf, the muted creak and clatter of Elric's harness and sword were the only sounds to break the stillness of the clear winter day as the pair rode steadily nearing the quaking, treacherous trails of the marshes of the mist. One gloomy night they reached the borders of the silent land, marked by the marsh, and they halted and made camp, pitching their silk tent on a hill overlooking the mist-shrouded wastes. Banked like black pillows against the horizon, the clouds were ominous. The moon lurked behind them sometimes piercing them sufficiently to send a pale, tentative beam down onto the glistening marsh or its ragged, grassy frontiers. Once a moonbeam glanced off silver, 
illuminating the dark silhouette of Elric, but as if repelled by the sight of a living creature on that bleak hill, the moon once again slunk behind its cloud shield, leaving Elric thinking deeply, leaving Elric in the darkness he desired. Thunder rumbled over distant mountains, sounding like the laughter of far-off gods. Elric shivered, pulling his blue cloak more tightly about him, and continued to stare over the misted lowlands. Shadela came to him soon, and she stood beside him, swathed in a thick woolen cloak which would not keep out all the damp chill in the air. Silent land, she murmured. Are all the stories true, Elric? Did they teach you of it in old Melnibane? Elric frowned, annoyed that she had disturbed his thoughts. He turned abruptly to look at her, staring blankly through the crimson irised eyes for a moment, and then saying flatly, The inhabitants are unhuman and feared, this I know. Few men ventured into this territory ever, none have returned to my knowledge. Even in the days when Melnibane was a powerful empire, this was one nation my ancestors never ruled nor did they desire to do so. Denizens of the Silent Land are said to be a dying race, far more evil than my ancestors ever were, who enjoyed dominion over the earth long before men gained any sort of power. They rarely venture beyond the confines of their territory nowadays, encompassed as it is by marshland and mountains. Sharia laughed, then with little humour. So they are unhuman, are they, Ulrich? Then what of my people who are related to them? What of me, Elric? Uh, you're human enough for me, replied Elric, insouciantly, looking her in the eyes. She smiled. No compliment, she said, but I'll take it for one, till your glib tongue finds a better. That night they slept restlessly, and as he had predicted, Elric screamed agonizingly in his turbulent, terror-filled sleep, and he called a name which made Sherea's eyes fill with pain and jealousy. That name was Cimarill. Wide-eyed in his grim sleep, Elric seemed to be staring at the one he named, speaking other words in a sibilant language which made Sharia block her ears and shudder. The next morning as they broke camp, folding the rustling fabric of the yellow silk tent between them, Sharia avoided looking at Elric directly, but later, since he made no move to speak, she asked him a question in a voice which shook somewhat. It was a question which she needed to ask, but one which came hard to her lips. Why do you desire the dead god's book, Elric? What do you believe you will find in it? Elric shrugged, dismissing the question, but she repeated her words less slowly, with more insistence. Very well, then, he said eventually, but it is not easy to answer you in a few sentences. I desire, if you like, to know one of two things. And what is that, Elric? Tall albino dropped the folded tent to the grass and sighed. His fingers played nervously with the pommel of his rune sword. Can an ultimate god exist? Or not? That is what I need to know, Sharia. If my life is to have any direction at all. The lords of law and chaos now govern our lives. But is there some being greater than them? Sharia put her hand on Elric's arm. Why must you know? she said. Oh, despairingly, sometimes I seek the comfort of a benign god, Sharia. My mind goes out lying awake at night, searching through black barrenness for something, anything which will take me to it, warm me, protect me, tell me that there is order in the chaotic tumble of the universe, and that it is consistent. This precision of the planets, not simply a brief, bright spark of sanity in an eternity of malevolent anarchy. Elric sighed, and his quiet tones were tinged with hopelessness. Without some confirmation of the order of things, my only comfort is to accept the anarchy. This way I can revel in chaos and know without fear that we are all doomed from the start, that our brief existence is both meaningless and damned. I can accept, then, that we are more than forsaken, because there was never anything there to forsake us. I have waited the proof, Sharia, and must believe that anarchy prevails in spite of all the laws which seemingly govern our actions, our sorcery, our logic. 
They see only chaos in the world. If the book we seek tells me otherwise, then I shall gladly believe in it. Until then, I will put my trust only in my sword and myself. Sharia stared at Alric strangely. Could not this philosophy of yours have been influenced by recent events in your past? Do you fear the consequences of your murder and treachery? Is it not more comforting for you to believe in deserts, which are really just? Alric turned to her, crimson eyes blazing in anger. But even as he made to speak, the anger fled him and he dropped his eyes towards the ground, hooding them from her gaze. Perhaps, he said lamely, I do not know. That is the only real truth, Sharia. I do not know. Sharia nodded, her face lit by an enigmatic sympathy. But Alric did not see the look she gave him, for his own eyes were full of crystal tears which flowed down his lean white face, took his strength and will momentarily from him. I am a man possessed, he groaned, and without this devil blade I carry I would not be a man at all.